My name is Laurus Vaughan. I've come from a company called SC5, and I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about HTML5 development in Windows 8 platform. Just as a short forward, uh, when we got in SC5 this invitation for like hold up speech on HTML5 development on Windows, uh, frankly speaking, that was actually my first time when I scratched the whole surface of this like potentially huge topic. But of, of course, like even before, uh, even before kind of like, uh, like doing the web application, I knew that, okay, this would be possible because a couple of other guys within our company had been doing like beautiful web application. And when I got like approach on this topic that, hey, would you hold the presentation? My answer was, of course, yes, I enjoy challenges. So, a uh, very short forward about myself because it probably gives you a little bit better insight on like what is coming and it probably like helps you to put things a little bit in the context. So, uh, I am an HTML5 developer and an architect. So, uh, as an architect, I pretty much mean that uh, within our SC5 company, I'm probably like one of the like senior guys within our company. And I also mean like senior by age. So, I tend to say that I'm slow and old man of, of our company. And kind of like being slow and old is actually good for an architect because it means then your code can't get overly complex. And uh, that's what I'm trying to like advocate, and that is simplicity. So uh, my like, work is like crafting applications that work on several different platforms. So I'm kind of like not going to particularly advocate of like any, any single platform itself. So for instance, we are doing stuff uh, for like pretty much like all the mobile platforms, including like Windows Phone 7.5 and of course like Windows Phone 8. Uh, also, we do uh, applications naturally for uh, how would I say like desktop browsers, and like later we have been doing even like embedded software for things like how do you call this like forestry machines and that sort of stuff. So it seems that okay, kind of like our like uh, work of putting HTML5 everywhere is. Uh, something that's quite hot topic at, at the moment, and everybody's trying to do it in different ways. And of course, I'm pretty excited, okay, now that we can also like put HTML5 into native Windows applications, and that is ultra cool for me. So uh, I'm not calling myself a web designer, okay, I have a little bit of a design education, but I'm like more or less a coder. Uh, I'm and I also must say that, okay, I'm not an expert Windows 8 developer. Within audience, I believe that we may have, a, I don't know, a hundred or so better Windows developers. But I dare say that I do know quite a lot about HTML5, and I do know quite a lot about JavaScript. And that's actually one of my reasons for, like, accepting this challenge of, like, putting that run on the win Windows 8, because I was pretty sure that, okay, I know that, okay, the browser is good. I should be able to take on the challenge. So for those uh, of you that don't know what HTML5 is, I need to grab this picture from Wikipedia. So we are not actually talking about a single standard, but a bunch of different standards for web. For web. So we have things like uh, that relates to the structure of the uh, code, so basically like normal like HTML code. Okay, we have like things related for the styling as in kind of cascading style sheets, or CSS3. Uh, we have like things for like vector graphics, like SVG. We have even standards for like video and, uh, and audio and whatnot. So basically we're talking about like a family of different standards that are actually still under development. So earlier I remember that there was some kind of uh, a schedule for standardizing HTML5 and that was uh, due something like uh, 2023 or something like that. Okay, it sounds kind of like for like technology guy, it sounds like, okay, this is like out of reality. Okay, luckily currently like the standards do in 2014, so probably like many of these things that are still as like working drafts, they either will be taken into HTML5 or like removed from that. But anyway, it's like a family of standards, and it's like quite important to also like bear in mind when somebody's like asking, that, is, if my, is my browser HTML5 compliant? What does it mean? It depends. But okay, this is like an easier question for me to answer. Like, what does Windows 8 mean for me? So, as I already mentioned, okay, 
it means at least first and foremost like fast HTML5 compliant browser engine and with that I mean like Internet Explorer 10 and of course the same engine is also like running in, in this like native applications so with fast I mean that okay it is the fastest or like among the fastest browser engines around so there's like a tight competition between Internet Explorer 10 and Chrome and uh, from the kind of user experience point of view, that means that, okay, if you're crafting an application using HTML5 technologies, in most of the cases, it will be fast enough. Uh, people have been asking from me, like, okay, what, what you can and what you can't do using HTML5. So my, like, uh, normal answer is, that, okay, pretty much, like, you should be able to do, like, all the ordinary stuff, but you might not want to try 3D games. And actually, I was quite happy to see this morning... Uh, the keynote speech that was actually pitching, that, hey, actually, there are people doing HTML5 games on Windows 8. So that pretty much proves that the engine itself must be quite fast. Of course, like Windows 8 also means me, I like huge, I'm growing, or like how to say, like growing a potentially huge ecosystem of consumer enterprise users. Windows is like always like made business for me because there's like a lot of users using it. Uh, to give a practical example, so uh, for like traditional websites that we create, uh, Windows by far is still the biggest operating system that is like running those browsers. Uh, Windows, uh, sorry, like Internet Explorer 10 support is like growing all the time. And of course, we know that many enterprises there's still like Windows 8, uh, sorry, like Internet Explorer 8 browsers and that kind of things around. So it has always been important and it always will be important. Then from like an application viewpoint, Windows means for me like access to the native services. So I would probably like draw like closest analogy uh, between like native applications wrapped in, say like this like wrapper technology like Apache Cordova, with the exception that okay this one actually probably like better support for for the real platform APIs. Uh, this one like probably better support for debugging and all that kind of stuff. So it's like more than just a wrapper. But on the other hand, it also means that, okay, you have like uh, visited these uh, morning speeches about these different kind of like Windows platform conventions and all these like uh, charms and different kind of bells and whistles. Uh, for me, that of course means it's like stuff that I need to learn if I want to make good applications. The good thing is, that, okay, now I finally have possibility for doing those using HTML5. But I still like must say that I'm still within the learning path. So if you're asking me like, okay, how to do this and that on Windows 8, I probably can give you an educated answer, but it's not necessarily a verified answer yet. So what would this mixture of like HTML5 and Windows 8 mean? Well, I have like said like HTML5 actually might be yet another ecosystem because there's like big developer base and there's like huge selection of open and extensible libraries. Uh, within this presentation, actually, we are going to like investigate on how to like take some of them into use into your native applications. On the like Windows 8 side, that means okay, my kind of like choice of APIs is supported, uh, like supplemented by wide selection of system APIs, and that's good because usually these, how do I say, system APIs need to be provided by the OS provider itself. They can't be implemented by third party. Uh, I got some like number from somewhere that they're like uh, literally like hundreds of thousands of these kind of like people that like turn them to like web developers. And I would say that probably might be like the widest developer base around. So like HTML5 or like JavaScript related technology have a su huge support in. And as I already mentioned, like Windows as a platform um, probably has like the widest user base. HTML5 and like coding on that technology means that okay, I can leverage the existing knowledge that I already have. And for Windows 8, okay, that means that okay, they're like good platform-wide conventions. I don't need to kind of make guesses on how I how I should be making my application. I can read the excellent MSDN documentation, for instance, or check their examples. Or I would just like phrase it this way. Windows and HTML5 means, for me, that means like the same style, a little bit different tools that I would use. But if you from yourself come from, uh, let's say, 
from the world where you're developing applications with, say, XAML and C Sharp, you could actually turn these phrases upside down. You would say, okay, it's still like different tools, but pretty much the same style. So if you kind of think about what, how you would compare uh, C Sharp and XAML to HTML, you could think about it like H HTML is to XAML what uh, C Sharp is to JavaScript. So pretty much the same kind of mix. And like, it doesn't like matter from like which side you come from, kind of the C Sharp word or from the HTML word, you will find something that's quite familiar to you. Let's actually cast a very quick vote so that I know a little bit like which kind of people we have in the audience. So how many of you uh, have been like developing apps using uh, XAML and C Sharp or C++? Okay, so most of the audience. How about like the HTML side? So how many of you have been developing so, like websites that contain JavaScript? Okay, so actually all, almost half as well. So that's good because then you have like really good foundation in this one. I'm going to give like a lot of kind of like, a, how would I say, not kind of verified facts, but kind of my feelings on how it feels for like developing for Windows 8. And this is kind of like my first impression when I started. Wow, it feels a little bit overwhelming. But okay, when I kind of started for checking like which kind of stuff we have, for instance, in this sample project, I found that actually this repeat pretty much the same patterns that I have been using all the time. And they actually use quite consistently. They're using like standard obedient way. They're just kind of, they're not like the exact same t tools that I have, that I, I have been using, but there are like a lot of similarities. So from my viewpoint, that means that, okay, my skills will transfer this for this environment quite well, whereas my exiting code might not transfer, at least not from the very beginning. And I fully kind of like understand on the, why it is like this, because uh, if you have, in, have been developing JavaScript application for the web, you probably have been using, I don't know, a few dozen different libraries. When we are making an application that usually has, I don't know, more than 10 uh, dependencies to external libraries. They might, might start from as simply, simple things as kind of like a standardizing how a thing as simple as clicking works in your application. And actually, if you already like go to like a, how to say, uh, if you kind of like start, try to like standardize, for instance, behavior for swiping between the screens, you actually may have like difficulties in finding a cross-platform compatible solution. Well, the nice thing is, okay, you don't need to like worry about these kind of, kind of things in Windows 8 because the platform like behaves pretty much the same across the devices. And so, basically, it means okay, there's like a lot of different libraries in JavaScript where they're like a little bit like inconsistent. So it's quite understandable, under, understandable that Microsoft provides you a full palette of different kind of libraries that you would utilize. So even if the kind of uh, how to say the tools that you would end up using even if they wouldn't be exactly the same that you have been using in the past, there's actually good like reasoning behind, behind that. And of course, that means that, okay, if you haven't been doing HTML5 development yet, you can start, like, start using this like one single consistent tool set instead of like trying to like uh, stitch your application from different pieces. So, let's have a like a quick look. This is a kind of like a quite like typical example on what our like HTML5 application might look like uh, and what like Windows 8 HTML5 application might look like. It is a simplification for a good reason. But uh, for instance, within our company, uh, when we are making applications, we are using a lot of an application framework or like model view control framework called Backbone. It's actually the one, one over here. It's a small box, but it actually has quite like a big impact on our code. And we are using library called jQuery as some kind of a compatibility layer. We don't usually like access the browser directly. We access it through the jQuery because we know that depending on the platform, oh sorry, depending on the browser, actually the DOM, domain object model implementation might be a little bit different. Uh, Okay, we always have, as I said, like huge set of different kind of utility libraries for like uh, working around uh, 
our way across the different like incompatibilities. And then we actually have like the bulk of the application code. So our applications are usually like structured almost like across like according to like model view controller model model view controller paradigm or it's probably kind of like model it probably actually could be called like model view model paradigm. But anyway the point is okay we have like a bunch of like models and this means uh, actually how would I say the places where we have the like data and it also like means okay that's usually where the kind of like connection to the back end happens. So in our case usually the back end means some kind of like restful API that we connect to. Okay, then we have kind of like a few different views that are totally data driven. So basically if they kind of like pull data from the models once the models are ready. But the views actually themselves, they are not kind of used in the same way as you have used to have in, in a typical model view controller paradigm because I would say that our views are actually a little bit of a controllers as well because they usually contain different event handling code and uh, they might even kind of con contain some like logic on how you kind of like uh, switch your application state. But what would be kind of like traditionally very something that you would be calling models are the things that we are calling templates. So usually when we are making applications they follow this single page application paradigm which means okay you only load like one web page and then you are just like modifying that on the fly. And these templates usually mean kind of, snippet of snippets of HTML code uh, that get just kind of like instantiated with a little bit different kind of data depending on what you have in the model. And then of course we have like some kind of code that like doesn't fit into the views but we try to minimize that. So if we compare that to what we have in the Windows 8 application side, uh, from the top it actually looks pretty much similar. So instead of like models, we have things called like data sources. You could think that this concept was pretty much one-to-one -one, that would transfer directly. Uh, then we have pages, and with pages I mean that okay, if you follow the like normal logic on how you structure the application, it's not a single page application. You actually may have like multiple different HTML pages that uh, get like used in a little bit the same kind of way as you have for templates. But it's quite like, like kind of like important uh, difference because at least like as a developer of like a single page applications, I feel that actually when the application switches from one page to another, something like uh, unexpected may happen. Kind of for instance, okay, some of my kind of application stay, state may get lost. Luckily, you don't necessarily have that problem in, in the Windows Windows 8 side. And of course you have like page specific logic for really kind of, that is the JavaScript side of your stuff. So the page is pretty much translate to HTML and it's like page specific logic translates to your JavaScript. Or the same thing, kind of your XAML and your C sharp. And uh, instead of like backbone that we are using typically, okay, we have a wonderful WinJS.UI set of libraries in use. But, uh, and basically like all that thing like sits on top of uh, your like web runtime where you have like normal like browser API as a WinJS API in your use. I was thinking that okay, we could already kind of like jump to a like small demo because I'm like, I actually must say that like I have like a quite like big background as a tools developer. So I'm like always like interested in different kind of tools and I'm like happy to present you how like Visual Studio and Blend work for for this kind of views. So you have probably seen this view probably like five times today already. So the tools that you are using for developing HTML5 applications are still the good good old like Visual Studio and Expression Blend. And even the structure is pretty much similar. I'm going to like show you just like a, in this like first demo, just like show you a couple of samples to show that okay, and there's like no magic behind uh, the HTML five applications. Like there's no, how would I say? Like the applications are really kind of real HTML five applications. They are not kind of uh, HTML five skeletons where you embed native controls or something like that. So 
you can say that, okay, you pretty much have the same kind of selection as, as of same sele selection of basic templates uh, in HTML5 as you would have for C Sharp application. And they pretty much follow the same structure. And um, uh, for like a like newbie, I would start for like, uh, from the like blank application because it's actually like easy to see what you have over here. Instead of like writing too much code, I'm actually going to just like read you a little bit about the code itself. So what you see over here on the right hand side is a pretty much like normal kind of uh, structure for any web application. So you usually have your own folder for CSS. That is how you style your application. Your like static assets, like images, and then your kind of logic, as in JavaScript code. And then you have your kind of HTML web page itself, and it really is standard web page. It even like declares here doc type HTML. That means that your document is HTML5 compliant, or it should be. Okay, like here you like declare a couple of other things that you would normally declare for a web application that hey, okay, you are like following some like certain char sets. So like the text that you have over here should be interpreted in a certain way. And okay, you can like even name your application. Here the name is like quite dull, app two. Okay, and to like elaborate a little bit more on these conventions. So here we are saying that okay, we are kind of referring to some uh, cascading style sheet. And we are actually using the one provided by platform's own. So there are like two different teams at least, like you are dark and you are light. And we are also like a, getting a little bit of JavaScript body from the platform called like base.js. And then we have like the UI.js, that's like WinJS UI. And then we have the application specific stuff. So we have our like default style sheet and then we have our like default JavaScript. You can like name them any, any way you like. But of course, like if you want to like strive for consistency, it might make sense that okay, you, if you're, uh, or actually, sorry, yeah, I think like actually your like startup web page needs to be def uh, named like default.html. But if you have like further web pages, you can like name them as you like. So, to just like show that okay, there's like no magic. I'm just like running this. Nothing exceptional happens. So you really see the code that you have over here. The content goes here. And to like give you a little bit of an example on what it means uh, for, for uh, from the debugger viewpoint. So at any point, we can pause the execution. So we can like debug the application pretty much the same way as we would be debugging a C-sharp application. It's not that different. Uh, to show you something, so there's like DOM Explorer, like shows what your application state is at the moment. Okay, our like default application doesn't do anything fancy, so it's actually pretty much the same HTML file that we used to have. Uh, we have the possibility for kind of checking this like different kind of bindings within the application. If you have been debugging code uh, on a web browser, you will all like uh, already feel at home because these are pretty much the same kind of tools as you would, as you would get for a web. So you select like a DOM element from here and then you are able to see like which kind of style sheet, uh, well, declarations would affect, affect that. And yeah, as they're like cascading, they're like a lot of different kind of styles that get like applied and overridden. Uh, let me show you another point from here. So let's like jump to JavaScript. So on the JavaScript side, you see it is pretty much standard JavaScript. And I think like it's actually more standard JavaScript than what you have used to see. Because by default, this template said, that, okay, you should be utilizing JavaScript in strict mode. So that for instance, like helps you with kind of not leaking variables or like not referring to variables that don't exist in your scope. And kind of uh, by following the kind of like good convention, like these templates say that, okay, this JavaScript code that you have, it gets like wrapped inside a function that gets executed in the end. So this is kind of like normal pattern in JavaScript that you utilize for 
again preventing leaking of your global variables. Then we have got a couple of like, how to say, a few like references for the application so that we don't need to like write all this like long stuff. And then we actually have a couple of like hundreds for the application lifecycle events. So for instance, it's like app.onactivated, for instance, this is the one that gets executed when you start your application. But you may start it from kind of how to say that you have like already started the application, but for one reason you have like jumped away from that and it may have get, got suspended. Or you really kind of start from scratch again. And then we have a, actually a little bit like magic, but it's because it actually, what it does is okay, if you have like WinJS UI elements, here we are saying that okay, like fetch like whatever bindings you have uh, in HTML and like bind that to data and like instantiate those like templates template HTML according to the data you got. It's not actually that visible in a blank sample. We will go through a better sample in, in no time. But what I want to show you over here is that, okay, you have like normal like debugging tools. So you can like set the breakpoints. Okay, now the application starts and it like jumps to the breakpoint. And you will be able to see what your state is at the moment. So for instance, in JavaScript, you will be able to see the different scopes of execution. So at least you will be seeing like what is part of this like current scope, nothing much. But for instance, you have been, you see that okay, some kind of like arcs variable has been declared over here. Within the debugger, you can like check like what is the state of this like arcs variable prior to start it. Currently, actually, it doesn't have like that much interesting stuff. It just like tell that your application got activated. Good. Let's pick a little bit more complex sample. So you would want to construct, let's say, a grid application. I could actually show you a little bit more kind of like a complete example that I know that's like proven in HTML5. I believe it also like proves the point that an application, like full-blown full -blown application can be made with HTML5. So and this is an application that actually has been constructed from within the templates, just like gradually building. So you can have like the beautiful, beautiful stuff like, okay, some kind of like image background, your own kind of look and feel, still obeying the Windows standards. And okay, it actually can have these things like lazy loading, so you pa see paging over here. Current data source actually doesn't like provide you infinite amount of different events. And yes, this can have like hierarchical structure as discussed, discussed in the previous examples. So you can like navigate through the article and back. So this is like all, eight, all like HTML, even with this like animations and, and stuff. So if you construct, oops, if you construct like for instance like new, let's say we could even like make the samples split application. And if you run it, you will instantly see the similarities. So you have like different groups. Okay, there's like nothing much kind of scrollable in this example. And then you have this like child views. And this is all, all HTML. And to give you a little bit like better example on how you could start kind of like modifying the skeleton, let's see what is hidden inside. So as I mentioned, these kind of applications are if you use like the normal navigation structure as provided by these templates, you will have like multiple different HTML files that are actually controlled by a navigation, this kind of like ready-made component. Let's see, we can see it from the JavaScript much better than from the HTML file. <coughs> so if you check from this like default Default JavaScript file is pretty much the same stuff as we had in previously. But what we say from over here is that, okay, once all the, like a processing of the UI, that means like creation of the templates has been done, then check that, okay, if we have some kind of like previous, or if we have some like current location, 
uh, set a little bit of stuff to the history, and then actually navigate to a new location. And the new location here really means a new HTML5 page. And you can, with the navigation, you can also like pass some like extra variables in that. And that is a JavaScript object. So, to give a kind of another example that, okay, there's like no magic, is okay, this is like a CSS file uh, for an item. It's probably like better seen if we actually open this thing in expression blend. And just like a word for like expression blend, um, we could actually like even, yeah, this actually like a di different file, but it's like found really from there. So, um, the funny thing was that, okay, it's been a long time since I was using a VisiWeek uh, HTML editor. That must date back to like 2003 or something like that. Back then, probably like best editor around was uh, probably Adobe Dreamweaver, but it didn't render my applications correctly. It was like a sort of uh, web renderer, but uh, the not good thing that I like about Expression Blend is that, okay, this is really the real thing. It is like browser running inside, inside over here. So I will actually show you later on like why I really mean it, okay, it makes a difference. So what you see over here, uh, okay, you're like HTML5 like elements. Uh, basically kind of like if you like navigate, for instance, over here within the code, you will be able to see like the corresponding elements over here. When you were like doing like a web development with the like good old fashion of like writing everything in the text editor, you would first like make a small change, then you would like reload your web page and see what happened. Uh, the good thing is like now you don't necessarily need to do that anymore. So to show that okay, there's no magic. It's okay. It's like content host is currently like the root level element. So if you basically say that you don't, for like one reason or another, you want to like break the standards. You don't like set it for, for full width, or sorry, and that's that's what you will what you will get. Oh, let's say that okay, you're a little bit like tired about this like uh, violet color that I put over there. Like, let's change it like back again, black again, and it works. And uh, then you also will see over here that okay, there are a couple of. Uh, things that are not like part of like a core CSS3 standard. So these are like extensions. So for instance, like this application has been like laid out as a grid. Well, uh, the nice thing is that, okay, uh, what you can do over here is that you can pretty much like define on how the grid is utilized. I will actually show this a little bit better in my, my own example. But like the in interesting point over here is that, okay, somebody might say that, hey, this is not according to CS3 standard. But the funny thing is that, for instance, like MS Grid and MS Flexbox and all these things, they actually have been like pitched for like uh, W3C like ages ago. There is a standard dating back to 2011 containing these extensions. It's more of a question like when the other browser will implement this. This works well at least on Internet Explorer 10, also on desktop. But anyway, we can like get probably back to the presentation because the point that I wanted to make over here is that okay, there's no magic. So, I already like mentioned that okay, we have a little bit different tools. So what do I mean by a little bit different tools? I already mentioned that in in the JavaScript and HTML5 world, we have like library, a separate library for everything, whereas in Windows, we have a little bit more holistic offering. So for package, man package managing, uh, we don't really have a standard in JavaScript. We have a lot of community projects called like Bower, for instance, or like NPM, that is for if, if you're running server-side JavaScript. And you can like also like use it on the client side to limited extent. Uh, frankly speaking, I haven't been using Nugget myself, but I just like checked. Okay, there are a lot of JavaScript libraries in repository, so I believe that it can be used for this purpose. In the version control, uh, in the HTML5 world, everybody's pretty much using JIT, and if it's a public project, you can pretty much find it in GitHub. 
the nice thing is that uh, I read from the uh, Microsoft blogs that like JIT support is also coming uh, to Visual Studio, uh, the next release. Uh, was it like a release two? I don't remember these names exactly, but basically like the next update is coming. So I'm able to like use my like favorite packet manager in that word as well. And then for the IDE, okay, in the HTML5 word, we actually have a lot of different editor, editors. I have been using Eclipse myself because I sort of like grew into that. I've been using it for everything, so I have been using it, it for HTML5 as well. But whereas in Visual Studio, okay, we, sorry, in Windows 8, we have Visual Studio. There's really like no reason to not use it. And for like expression blend, I would actually put that to the power of two. There's really no ye reason to not use expression blend. You don't have a better tool, as, tool elsewhere. Okay, when we're talking about uh, web applications and like transferring them into Windows 8 domain, most likely that means that, okay, you will have some kind of service at endpoint somewhere. Uh, and most likely you will need to run some like local test server of yours. We have been doing a lot of like Node.js stuff. It actually means that, okay, we are able to use JavaScript for coding the service side stack as well. Well, the nice thing is that, like that also runs on Windows side. So I don't need to switch tools over there. So that also looks fine and dandy. <sighs> then for the operating system, yeah, of course we could be using Windows 8. Actually, I'm currently like running this presentation on Windows 8 on Parallels on OS X. Uh, the reason really is that uh, Unfortunately, like Apple doesn't provide tools for like virtualizing, virtualization of OS X. I'm not even sure if that is legal or like according to the contracts. But Windows 8 runs fine on virtual machine. So it's not kind of like, a, how to say, like rent for, for or against on like any single platform. It's more like, okay, this is how I can like support all the, all the platforms. I'm happy to have it in a virtual machine. And like a switch native machine, I like how to say a PC machine if I like. Okay, what else is different? Well, on the library side, I would say pretty much everything, and it's not necessarily a bad thing as I mentioned. So, in JavaScript side, there's really no good UI widget library for all the use cases. So when we are like constructing these sites that work on desktop, we have been using, for instance, Twitter Bootstrap. Or when we are doing stuff on mobile, we have been using jQuery Mobile. But unfortunately, they don't mix and match. And unfortunately, you can't just like stick to one library. On the Windows 8 side, okay, we have like WinJS UI, and of course, you have the possibility of like creating a user interface from scratch using your own components and widgets. But I really don't see kind of like a business reason for that. If you like plan to like uh, implement the platform standards, why don't you use the components that implement the platform standards? And the same pretty much applies for the MVC framework. I mean, we have kind of like beautiful, beautiful components of their own. Whereas in, in the like good old like HTML5 world, we would be using Backbone or Angular or knockout or whatnot. Too many to mention. Uh, on the HTML5 documents, uh, we have been using a lot of these things that we call responsive grids. So the responsive grid pretty much means, that, okay, you have a HTML5 page that would need to scale for mobile and it would need to scale for tablet and it would need to scale for desktop. And they're like ready-made libraries for that for instance, like the semantic.js is what I have been using personally, but there are like a lot of others. Well, unfortunately, like none of these libraries themselves, uh, as far as I know, like none of these ready-made grids implement this window, Windows 8 specific things, like, okay, snapping your application into this, how did you call this? Uh, is it like snap view or, or whatever? So basically the one that you have it on the side. It's not actually that different from having like 320 pixels wide wide uh, uh, grid, but on the other hand, if you have these things implemented, we can actually see an example from the uh, from sample application soon. Why wouldn't you 
use the platform provided layouts. Because it usually starts in that kind of way that, okay, if you first kind of like take the widget set, set from the platform and you take the kind of your kind of like top level UI framework from the platform, then it pretty much means like everything that you do with the UI, uh, you need to basically use the like same set. So like all the grid, the widgets, the framework. And and I don't know, if you like if you want to make applications that like obey the platform conventions, that's the most reasonable way to go, at least from my viewpoint. Then on the other end, okay, in the HTML5 world, okay, as I mentioned, the browser behaves differently. So we need like library for like doing feature detection. And modernizer is probably the de facto standard for that. In the Windows 8, again, like things are standardized, we don't necessarily need that. Then on the modular, as they say, modular, modularization side, difficult world, word, uh, we are using library called require.js. This actually needs a little bit of elaboration because you might think like, why would I need to have like some kind of modules in JavaScript? Well, the point is that once, once you start having uh, 20 different libraries that are all defined in a global namespace, then you will run into problem that, oops, actually, some of these like namespaces are like conflicting with each other. You don't want to declare them like, all in the namespace, and, and you don't necessarily know like in which the, uh, um, which order they are defined. So, for instance, let's say that okay, backbone itself like depends on jQuery, and uh, if you basically start using jQuery before you have uh, loaded, uh, sorry, if you start using backbone before you have loaded jQuery. It means that your application would fail because Backbone expects that jQuery is loaded. So for these kind of cases, we have required JS. Well, the good thing in Windows 8, okay, if you have structured your application so that these different views have like a HTML page of their own, uh, the problem becomes much simpler because the ap application is already going to split into multiple different modules. So you don't necessarily need a framework like required JS, but you as far as I know, you can have it if you like. And then, of course, you have this like Cordova API for kind of like uh, wrapping your HTML5 application into a native, native runtime. But my own tip for this is that, okay, like write your first Windows 8 application using the Microsoft provided tools because there's a lot of love put into them. The tools are actually quite good, even, even if they're different from the ones that you have been using. And then, okay, once you have the application up and running and you know how these tools behave, how these different libraries and APS behave, then you can start kind of like gradually taking stuff back from your existing stack. Uh, the reason why I started to go this way is that, okay, if you take the, like 20 or so libraries and basically it's like first like inject all those into your own Windows 8 application. Some of them will fail because for instance, there's actually quite a strict security sandbox on Windows 8. There should be one because uh, you are accessing the like native platform. You can't like load, lib load for instance JavaScript from the, from the net. So some of the libraries will fail and you want to have them like failing one by one because then you will find a workaround. And actually, that is what this like next short demo is about. So uh, when I uh, started doing this presentation, I was thinking, okay, let's like make some like small application that uh, that would do something that's like related for this uh, conference itself. So. I happened to like notice that okay, there's like this like TD two twelve. Wow, it's like battery is low. I probably need to like plug the plug the cable. Just a moment. It's actually good that the Windows Windows gives me the warning. There you go. Yeah. So I basically wanted to make something that is actually related for this event. And okay, I showed this like Twitter hashtag, and I was thinking that hey, actually it would be quite nice to see if by a chance uh, anybody would be tweeting me 
I'm a narcissist by, narcissist by nature. So I thought, okay, let's actually kind of like make a Twitter feed and build a small like word cloud out of that. We are not basically constructing this whole whole thing as, as the demo, but I'm showing like how it's constructed. And uh, what I wanted to show over here in, kind of in, in better and worse is the fact, okay, what happens if you like inject kind of like somebody else's uh, widget as is? And what happens if you like inject some like other like library that would be doing something else? Actually, this thing is not HTML, it is SVG. It is using a beautiful library called D3. I will, let me actually show you, show you the different libraries so that you know, know the starting point. So, this actually, I believe like D3 is also like a good, good kind of like example on kind of uh, showing you why somebody might want to use ready-made JavaScript libraries because there's some like good stuff as well. So, for instance, okay, this is implemented with D3 as an, a kind of like SVG. So it's like fully interactive application for kind of drawing like relations between two different things. And pretty much all these are like SVG stuff. And, uh, and and the nice thing is like the SVG implementation actually quite fast on Internet Explorer 10 as well. But okay, it seems my network connection is not that fast. But basically, like plentiful, plenty of like different examples on like what kind of visualizations you can do. And uh, let's say it's probably possible to like make this kind of stuff also using C Sharp or something like that. But I wouldn't want to do it from scratch by myself. It is a beautiful library that you might be able to reuse. Uh, okay, then we had the idea, okay, let's basically just like pick a Twitter feed from somewhere. And uh, I have been previously using this kind of library. There are actually many libraries around. But the idea about this one is, okay, you just kind of have some kind of like an empty element somewhere that gets filled by the filled by the uh, library itself. So these were the starting points, and you already saw the result. So uh, probably like first question, like how was the application itself structured? So actually, this is about another thing, and this one is the main thing. So there are not actually that many guys change it for the like default template itself. The same like basic basic stuff being using used, like the basic theme and the basic like WinJS dependencies, then the WinJS UI. We are not actually using this that heavily. Then we have okay our like own CSS file. There's pretty much like no other like in interesting definitions than the placement of the like title bar the JavaScript, and then it's like external dependencies. So we have the D3.js, and then it's like word cloud implementation. And then we have like utility tool belt called underscore for like dealing with array and object manipulation. And then a little bit of our code is utilizing that one. And then for the body, we can see that it's like already almost blank. We have the title, and as you see, standard HTML5 tags with a little bit of styling information. And then we have like a placeholder for the graph, and then actually the trick comes here. So one would first think that, okay, if you want to inject a Twitter feed like this into your application, there should be no problems regarding the security. Well, uh, the challenge is that, okay, this library like loads the Twitter feed using XML HTTP request. And uh, the default sandbox is quite strict on like what you can do when you are kind of like accessing things from your so-called local context. Let me show what local context means in practice. Uh, I think I, yeah, we have it over here. Yeah, so basically when you're like running from JavaScript 
running JavaScript, you actually may have like two different execution contexts. So it's like local context means, okay, access the, plat access the platform like a native application, have the restrictions related, like ha have the, like, like the, re the restrictions so that uh, this application wouldn't possibly kind of like do any anything harmful. Okay, then it's like web context means uh, run it as a browser, run it like a browser. So you basically might be able to get kind of external external stuff and whatnot. And uh, kind of like my kind of like general like rule of thumb is that okay, if you can't easily make your third-party widget work as part of the local context put it into web context. You can make an iframe of that of your own. So a potential use case for this one, for instance, could be that the uh, Windows platform uh, permits you to have third-party advertisement. So you can use somebody else's advertisement library. And most likely, there's like a piece of JavaScript and possibly some kind of like iframe that you need to inject somewhere. So you might be like running that in a web context, for instance. Then in the local context, okay, that is place where you are probably like accessing your platform features. So the trick over here is that uh, we are actually loading the widget feed into an iframe of its own. And actually the scrolling thing is actually irrelevant over here. Let's not care about that. And then the kind of feed itself is actually quite dummy. So I like happen to structure it this way that I put it all this like third party widgets into the, in the widgets. And this is again just like a normal web page that loads its own CSS and the tweet stuff. And here you have the placeholder where you can inject the feed. So there's like one way of like working around the limitations. Uh, okay, another thing that you can see from here is that, okay, you don't need to like load all the external libraries in the web context. So for instance, okay, as you see, the place where we inject the uh, SVG graphics is like a normal div element. And actually we load the D3 library over here. The reason is that, okay, the D3 doesn't load anything from the web. Uh, it doesn't actually do something that would be potentially harmful for your application. You can use it as is. And so you can do for the for this utility library. So now we have a code running in two different contexts. We have something in the web context and something in this uh, local context. And they don't know about each other. So how are we messaging between these? So as you can see, so we have the, like feed over here, and for like one reason or another, actually my like fancy demo application didn't. Ah, oh, it worked after all. So what actually happens? Okay, this one loads the feed, whereas this one also like consumes the feed in its own way. How does that happen? Again, there's actually no magic. There actually might be some like micro specific, specific way of doing this, but I'm doing it in the same way as we normally do for communicating between different frames. So let's see that from the feed. So we have the feed over here. So there's actually just kind of like, we're like first like injecting this widget. And then, okay, what we are, yeah, there's like a little bit of extra code for telling that actually whatever kind of links you get don't actually use the normal A attribute, but actually tell that like all the links that you click go to a blank page. So for this, we are using this for the reason that, okay, this is the way how we can like open these external links in the new browser window. But the real beef is, o beef is over here. So basically this function gets called when the tweet itself is loaded. So we know that, okay, that is like a JavaScript array of tweets. And what we now want to do is, okay, we put it into a string. We put it into a string because uh, these frames can exchange messages with each other uh, in form of text. So we first basically make it, make it a text, textual string. And then we just say that the, for the parent window, post a message and actually don't care about like which kind of domain it came from. So basically like the parent frame gets gets this um, 
uh, string when when a feed gets loaded. Okay, how are we handling that then? So this is the code for actually drawing drawing the feeds uh, into this word cloud. So probably kind of like interesting point over here is that okay, we actually use the standard HTML5 API and saying that okay for the window, add or start to listen message type of events and when you get one call handle frame message and I don't even like re remember what the third parameter was about it wasn't important so we get this like message event what we do is that, okay the event has a data part we know that okay it is a string we pass it again as an object and then we start doing a little bit of magic. And here we actually use the like, third party library called underscore for doing the magic. We could actually set a breakpoint over here to see why we would actually want to use a third party library for a simple thing as like manipulating the objects. So we just like jumped into this breakpoint. And uh, here we can see that, okay, we have a like object called tweet. It has a lot of stuff. Actually, let's like jump like one step forward because that is already a little bit too deep. Come on. Yeah, so the point is, okay, we have like a lot of different tweets over here. All they contain like a lot of data. So this is actually pretty much the object form of the same JavaScript object notation that you will get from Twitter feed. And what we want to do is look at like only like one important piece of text that is pretty much called raw text or was it the tweet text, something like this. We basically want to pick this. Uh, we want to basically put like slice that into different, uh, how would I say, by different words. We want to filter away some like words that we are not interested in. So basically, all this kind of like what are, like this for and uh, and and this is like common words. We don't want to basically use those in the word cloud and so forth and so forth. So here's like where like underscore magic comes as a helper. So we can like flatten this exiting array. We can basically like remove all the words that we don't want to have. Then we make kind of count of the number of different kind of words and then we actually transform them into JavaScript objects and actually for those ob objects we remove all those that have been only only done once so let's say okay I could have easily spent like one day for like writing this algorithm by myself if I didn't have the help of the tools so the tools are good and the, you should be basically using the JavaScript that you have uh, let's get back to the actual presentation itself because it seems that we are like soon running out of time. So the point that I wanted to make over here is that okay, if you want to make like WinJS, I'm sorry, like Windows 8 application, you probably should be using WinJS UI. We didn't actually show it in this like later example because uh, you could basically like read the same information from the MSDN. You have this like good examples. What I wanted to show you is that, okay, you can use third-party libraries with some restrictions. So from your ep existing applications, uh, okay, you probably will need to scratch the UI layer. Uh, but what you can keep is how you bind to the third-party services. And like the, all the like, logic that you need for like passing that input data and whatever manipulation you want to do. Uh, on the Windows 8 side, okay, you need to basically wrap that into a native container. So that like includes the work of kind of like adding these splash screens, adding the uh, different like icons, maybe like implementing the tiles, implementing the platform specific things. Okay, that is platform specific, so naturally you need to do it specifically for this platform. But the nice thing is that, okay, you should be able to actually keep the project as part of your, how to say, as part of the same solution. So you can have like Win, Windows 8 specific project and then you might have like a desktop browser specific project and maybe, I don't know, a mobile website specific project that can share some of the same code. And of course, like all the things needed uh, related for that for like, for instance, okay, finally, you need to actually build the JavaScript code. 
we could actually check that as some kind of extend, extended topic later on. But you might actually want to kind of like minimize your JavaScript. You might want to obfuscate it. You might want to kind of uh, compress the images and all that kind of stuff. That's like best done in a build. And you can use the existing tool for that because in the end, what you're going to like run inside a Windows 8 container is a, it's a browser after all. And yes, obviously, if you want to like access anything specific to the platform, yeah, you need to like learn the WinJS API. We didn't go through that uh, for the reason. That, again, you can check it from the MSDN, and pretty much these APIs are like one to one with what you have in the, uh, for instance, the C sharp side. So the same patterns pretty much apply over there. But what we did skim a little bit. Okay, you can actually really do this like normal like JavaScript type of ray usage. You pick a library from somewhere, you kind of like put that into a project, and then you start to play with that. You take that into your use. It is possible. So after this kind of thing, like is your application, how would I say, is it the same application as you had in your web? Uh, I would say, no, it's not going to be the same application because it is like totally different UI and as a result, this has like different, different kind of like interaction logic. You can't expect that, okay, this kind of thing would happen by parameter, parametricizing your build or something like that. It just won't happen. And if it would happen, probably your application would be, I would say, much worse than like other Windows applications. But okay, uh, you still are able to like use the same skill. You can use the HTML, the standard HTML. You can use standard JavaScript. You can use standard CSS. You will just use them a different way. And you will be able to use third party libraries as well. It's not a blocker. I think we are already like two minutes uh two minutes late, but there would be time for maybe a couple of questions unless somebody stops me. So any questions at this point? Shoot. Ah, yeah, we actually didn't like check this like packaging packaging part itself, but you basically would use pretty much the same kind of uh, tools as you would have, for instance, for C-sharp application. So basically, you're going to fill in like manifest information of your own, and the channel would be Windows Store. Any other questions? OK, then I believe we can wrap it up. And of course, like, uh, please kind of uh, come and have a chat in the dinner, or like use Contact me through Twitter or whatever. And thanks for the presentation. Thanks for your time. Now let's have some socializing.